Amen and amen. Hey, my name is Jordan. I'm one of the pastors here at Renaissance. Very grateful to be with you all uh, this Sunday. So I've done many stupid things in my life, uh, things that I'm not proud of. Uh, I once upon a time thought that once I became a Christian, once I got baptized, there would be this like line of demarcation in my life that I used to be a sinner and now I'm a saint and I don't sin anymore. I might make a little, you know, a couple mistakes every now and then, but not like real sin that really disappoints me or disappoints God. And, you know, nothing I've done in the last number of years will make the headlines. It's not, you know, CNN worthy, but there's been so many times where I have been painfully aware that I am a sinner in need of grace. Not like um, fake grace, but real grace. You know, I was thinking about it the other day, you know, when my sons were born, I remember looking at them in their eyes and making them a promise that I certainly have not kept, uh, making them a promise that I would never erupt in them, at them in anger. And I have felt the chill in our apartment after I've erupted and lost my temper at one of my kids, and then just a feeling of guilt and sometimes shame. What kind of man am I? What kind of father am I, you know? I'm a terrible father, and then just the list of all the ways I want to accuse myself run um, through my brain. Now, all of us, if we are honest with ourselves, I think, we would be very aware that in life, we will fall short of not just our standards for ourselves, but we'll also fall short of God's standards. Scripture, they call that sin. God has a standard for life. God has a standard for holiness. God has a standard for how you should live live your life. And we routinely and consistently fall below that standard. One of the questions I like to ask people is, can you name a week in your life when you could not have done better? When you were like, oh, no, that last week was perfection. There's not one thing I could have done better in my life. So if you couldn't do it for a week, imagine trying to live your entire life with this. And so I wish I could undo things. I wish I could unsay things. I could be, you know, it could be 11.30 at night, I could be brushing my teeth and I'll think about something I said three years ago in the lobby, like, why did I say that? (laughs) None of us have a time machine to go backwards to undo the things that we've done. None of us have a time machine to undo the hurt that we've caused someone else, the hurt that we've caused, uh, the sin that we've done in our lives to offend God. So what do you do with your failures? If we can't undo them, what should we do with them? So for the next two weeks, we're talking about uh, the most, one of the most important topics in the Bible and something called forgiveness. What it looks like for us to live as a forgiven person, as a forgiven person, and also what it means to forgive other people. So we've been in a series called The Lord's Prayer, uh, Teach Us to Pray. Once upon a time, Jesus was with, his, was with his disciples and they asked Jesus, hey Jesus, can you teach us to pray? Jesus in his goodness uh, doesn't um, beat around the bush, but he gives them and he gives us a direct model of what a healthy biblical prayer life should look like. So if you've ever, ever wondered, like, what is God's will for your life? Like, God, what is your will? Would you teach me your will on different things? If you ever ask God, how should I pray? This is how you should pray. Because the first verse, it says this, therefore, you should pray like this. Our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, a big warning for today. Um, Every time we start talking about forgiveness, people's brains immediately go to the people in your life that you might need to forgive or you might struggle to forgive. That is an incredibly important topic. However, for the purposes of today, we are not thinking about forgiving other people. That's an an amazingly important topic, and next Sunday will be all about that. Today, for the purposes of today, we're going to look at this first line, forgive us our debts, and to consider what it looks like for us to live as forgiven people, that we would live truly with an awareness and an acknowledgement that we are forgiven. 
Now, if you're in DNA groups and somebody in your group this week, week starts talking about um, how difficult it is for them for, to forgive someone else, I want you to grab them by their shoulders. No, don't grab them. But I do want you to stop them and say, hey, we only want to talk about what it looks like for us personally to live as forgiven people. If you jump and go to the next level of what it means to forgive someone else, you're going to miss out on this incredibly important truth that is necessary for you to forgive anybody else, what it looks like for you to be a forgiven person. And so Jesus uses an interesting word here on forgiveness. He says, forgive us our debts. And why does he say the word debt? Uh, Some translations use the word uh, forgive us our sins or our trespasses. But Jesus links the concept of sin and debt. And I think the reason he does that is um, because sin in our life creates a relational debt that we have with God. You know, I remember when I was in college, as soon as I turned 18, they had these marketers that were standing outside with these basketball hoops that hung over your dorm room door, and all you had to do to get it was sign up for a credit card. I couldn't wait. I ran to them. I cut class to sign up for a credit card. And as soon as I got that credit card in the mail, my father would always say, a fool and his money soon depart. They gave me a $1,000 limit. I blew through that joint like in eight days. It was gone. Now, up to this point, I had never had a credit card. I didn't know what it was, so I thought it was good. Throw it in the bag. It was the best eight days of my life. And then the bill started to come. And I was playing basketball in college, so I didn't have a job. I had no way of repaying this. And so for the first couple of months, I just ignored it. Maybe it'll go away if you just throw the mail away. Right, not a good idea. (laughs) By the time I started checking the the mail, uh, it had already started to have compound interest. And then I said, well, I'm just going to make the minimum payment every month of like $9.99. And... After like a year, that $1,000 grew to like $3,000, and it was just compounding and growing more and more. And every single time, really, I would go home and be around my parents, I would always feel like really weird because like debt just created this feeling that like something was hanging over my head. And they would say, well, how are you doing? And I'm like, I'm, I'm doing good, I guess, knowing that I had this debt in my life. Now, my parents loved me, and... Uh, I was embarrassed and ashamed to admit that I I got got uh, just for a basketball hoop. And um, eventually, my parents graciously paid off the credit card debt for me. Uh, My father, not so graciously, but they paid it off (laughs) to get me out of, of debt. Now, Christianity offers us something. First, it's an offense, and then it is the way forward. The offense is that You and I are sinners in need of forgiveness. And this is implicit in what Jesus is doing when he's teaching people to pray. Now, by saying you are sinners in need of grace and forgiveness is not saying you are the worst person to exist. It's not meant to make you feel shame. It's meant to make us feel to live in reality. And the reality is we live below God's standards. And the way forward is not any of the self-prescribed ways that we try to go about it. Now, there's a lot of different ways that you and I try to navigate Uh, our shortcomings uh, before God, one of them is we try not to think about it, right? So there's a lot of people who just don't come to church because every time you come to church, some preacher just makes you feel bad. And you're like, I don't want to go to church just to feel miserable. Um, I could do a million other things that maybe make me feel bad. So I'll just skip it all together. And so we, we have a lot of different ways in which we try to just not think about it, to avoid even the concept of us falling short of God's standards. Others of us, um, we minimize it or we rationalize it. The best way to do this is by comparing yourself to someone else. I know I'm bad, but I'm way better than this person is. And so since I'm better than them, I'll find somebody who I'm better than in my brain, and then eventually I'll feel better about myself. Or another way we try to do it, this is my my go-to move, is I, I try to beat myself up. And in my brain, I just have this idea that if I beat myself up enough, if I make myself feel miserable enough, then eventually I will be forgiven. But the problem is this. Emotionally, there is no limit to how much pain you can inflict yourself. Physically, there are limits. If you go to the gym and you do too many squats, you're not going to be able to walk the next day. Emotionally, there are no such limits. How do you know when you beat yourself up enough? 
How do you know? How do you know when you've talked down to yourself enough? How do you know when you felt terrible long enough? Is it a day? Is it a week? How long should you feel terrible about yourself? And so we have all these different ways, whether it's rationalizing, minimizing. Sometimes we blame other people, right? I wouldn't have done this if you didn't talk to me like that. We have all these different ways, and none of those things are what the Bible offers us, what Scripture offers us. Scripture offers us actual forgiveness. When I say forgiveness from God, I mean that forgiveness is to stop feeling anger towards someone, someone who has done something wrong, to stop blaming or to stop requiring payment for something that is owed. So quite literally, when Scripture says that God offers us forgiveness, it means that God is not angry at you. It means that God is not blaming you. And it means that God is no longer requiring payment from you. But many of us do not live with that reality. And I think one of the best ways that this shows up is actually in our prayer life. For many of us, and for much of my prayer life, uh, I literally would start with just acknowledging how terrible I am as a person. God, I'm so bad. I'm so sorry. I'm, I did this. I did this. Then I would ask for like three things. And then I would end with God. I know I'm terrible. I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And then prayer just felt lifeless. It just felt terrible. So then I just didn't pray. And then I would feel bad about not praying. And I would add that to the list of things that I would apologize to God for the next time I started to pray. So there's a, a much better way than doing that, a much healthier way, a much a way that actually draws us closer to God, um, and it is through receiving forgiveness. Now, we struggle to, to really feel forgiven for a couple of reasons. One of the main reasons we struggle to feel forgiven is this. You and I are around people who have not forgiven us. I n know several people um, in my life that I've done something wrong and they've never forgiven me. And it's still kind of like something that I feel when I think about it, that there's something that you've done, something that you've said, and they, like, they just won't forgive you. So sometimes when we think about receiving forgiveness from God, it's hard to even fathom because there's people that you know, sometimes people in your family who just remind you of the things that you've done wrong, and they'll, like, they're not going to let go of it. And so we bring some of that dysfunction into our relationship with God. And other times, it's unbelief. We don't actually believe what Scripture says about forgiveness. So we're going to look at a lot of those things today. So one of the scriptures that I love is in John 1, and it's uh, a man named John the Baptist talking, uh, and he's giving a description of Jesus. And the reason they call him John the Baptist is not because he wasn't John the Presbyterian or John the Pentecostal, uh, but rather his ministry was about baptizing people. And right now John is in the wilderness, and he's talking about Jesus. And he says, I baptize with water, John answered them. Someone stands among you, but you don't know him. He is the one coming after me, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to untie. All this happened in Bethany across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Here's what the scripture writers say about Jesus, that he is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Jesus doesn't just, like, Febreze away sin. When I was in college, um, I'm potty trained now, y'all, because I'm, I'm married. My wife got me in check. But when I was in college, I don't think I like, I would wash my sheets before I started the semester and at the end of the semester. Listen, I was 18. <laughs> but I was the Febreze king. I would go to Rite Aid and have mad Febreze on deck. And listen, Febreze is amazing for like a day and a half. 36 hours, that joint smells incredible. The problem is when the smell comes back, it comes back with compound interest, uh, <laughs> even worse than what it was before. Um, but for a lot of us, when we think about what Jesus does for us, we think that he just kind of like masks it a little bit, but then it's going to come back. Like, surely it's going to come back and haunt me later. What Scripture says is Jesus doesn't do that. He doesn't forbreeze sin. He takes away the sin of the world. Do you believe that? For those of you who have put your faith in Jesus, do you believe that he has taken away your sin from you? That as far as the east is from the west, that's how far he has separated you from your sin. That's, that's how far it's not even near you anymore. 
Now, what this was, was referring to is the Old Testament feast and festival of the Day of Atonement, where once a year they would take a lamb and they would send it into the wilderness and they would place the sins of the people on this lamb and they would send it to the wilderness never to be seen again. So what they were talking about was this, the sin that the people had committed, committed would be sent away and it would never be seen again. And Jesus is our sacrificial lamb. And so I want to look at a psalm today for the rest of our time together about what it looks like really for us to live as forgiven people. For those of us who have placed our faith in Christ, for those of you who are considering Christianity, what it will look like for you to be a Christian, to give your life to Jesus, to follow him, and to live as a forgiven person. Psalm 32 says these words, How joyful is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How joyful is a person whom the Lord does not charge with iniquity, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones became brittle from my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was drained as in the summer's heat. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not conceal my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is faithful to you, pray, uh, let everyone who is faithful pray to you immediately. And so I think in order for us to truly live with, uh, as a forgiven person, it's a number of things that we need to keep at the forefront of our minds. And I want to highlight a couple of things today from this psalm. The first thing I want us to highlight is gratitude, right? So if you look at verses one and two, Again, how joyful is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered? How joyful is a person uh, whom the Lord does not charge with iniquity and in in whose spirit is no deceit? And so there is a gratitude that you and I are supposed to live with. And gratitude is a spiritual discipline that requires reminding yourself of the faithfulness of God, even when you don't necessarily and readily feel or sense it. During COVID, my wife uh, did a, a gratitude journal Uh, really at the worst part of the pandemic. And the point of it was that every single day to remind herself of the things that she had, not to make up things or not to minimize the challenge of what was happening. There was so much loss and even death in her family that was happening. But it was this spiritual practice that sustained her and also sustained me during the worst time. And gratitude is one of those things. It is the practice that the Lord invites us to, to rehearse Um, the truth, even sometimes when it hasn't made its way to sink deeply into your heart just yet. And so there is an aspect to living living as a forgiven person that requires you and I to rehearse the truth of Scripture in our hearts until that becomes a reality in our lives. Uh, You know, one of the the dopest parts about about Renaissance are all of the amazing types of people we have here. And we have a lot of people uh, in the theater uh, community at Renaissance and I was talking to a brother at our church who uh, really, at this point in his career, he's opening up shows, and that's something that he gets to do. And I was talking to him about, well, how does he become a character? And he says, well, I rehearse it until that character becomes a part of me. So that when you're on stage during the show, you're not trying to memorize or you know, recite the lines that you memorized. It's in you. And there is a piece of us that needs to rehearse, rehearse the truth of Scripture until it's in us. And part of the reason we don't live as forgiven people is because we're not uh, availing ourselves to the ancient practices that have sustained people for thousands of years. So one of the main things we can do is to rehearse our forgiveness, the truth of Scripture. One of those truths in Romans 8 and 1 through 3, it says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, Because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do since it was weakened by the flesh, God did. DJ Khaled owes the Apostle Paul royalties. (laughs) He condemned sin in the flesh by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as a sin offering. So Paul says two things. He highlights two different laws. One law is a law of sin and death. And here's a law of sin and death. It sounds harsh, but here it is in reality. When you sin, something dies. When you lie to your friend, a little bit of the connection that you and her or you and him had died. 
Now, by God's grace, God brings dead things back to life. Relationships can be restored. But we all know what that feels like to be on either side of the law of sin and death. When someone sins, something dies. Trust dies. Intimacy, connection dies. That is a law of sin and death. The law of sin and death is that there's a separation that happens when there is sin. And the prophet Isaiah says, and your sins have separated you between you and your God. Now, if that was the end of the story, that is a depressing story. But this is not the end of the good news of Jesus Christ and the gospel that he has come to proclaim to us and to demonstrate to us. You know, they call Christianity good news, not good advice. And one of the most beautiful things about Christianity uh, is seen here in verse 1, that there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. And then Paul mentions another law, which is the law of the spirit of life in Christ. Now, the law of the spirit of life in Christ is stronger than the law of sin and death. It doesn't mean the law of sin and death has gone away. It just means that there is another law happening at the same time that can conquer the law of sin and death. So, This happens all the time. Anybody who's taken a flight or a trip anywhere recently, there is a law of gravity. The law of gravity says that if you throw something up in the air, it will fall. And for humans living in our own bodies, gravity is something that keeps us pinned to the earth 24-7, 365. That being said, every time you've hopped in an airplane, you've gotten inside of something that was able to help you conquer the law of gravity and get you seated 35,000 feet in the air, eating pretzels and watching bad movies. It's not because you're good, it's because you are in something that is more powerful than the law of gravity. Scripture says that for those, there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus because the spirit of of, of life in Christ is stronger than the law of sin and death. For those of us who have placed our faith in him, we can relax. You know, There's a scripture in John 6 where these religious people come to Jesus and they say, Jesus, what do we need to do? What what is the work that God requires? And here's what Jesus says, believe in the one that he has sent. God wants you to work to believe in what he has done for us on the cross in Christ. And that work will produce in us a relaxedness where we are able um, to truly be aware and then to recount with gratitude. All right, number two, uh, first is gratitude. And the life of a Christian should be full of conviction, but empty on condemnation. The life of a Christian should be full of conviction, conviction about what God has called you to do, how God has called you to be, but empty on condemnation. Condemnation does not add to anything. The second piece, I think, to truly living as a forgiven person is acknowledging our sin Um, and failure to acknowledge sin really does erode us from the inside out. You see in verses three through five, the psalmist says, when I kept silent, my bones became brittle from my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was drained as in the summer's heat. And basically what he's saying is like, if you've ever been outside for a long time in dry heat, it just takes away your energy. And he's describing the condition of someone who is unwilling to acknowledge his sins and shortcomings, and it drains the life and vitality out of us. And so I just want to read a scripture that I want you to continue to rehearse over and over and over and over again until it becomes a part of you, until it becomes in you, until it brings life uh, to you. 1 John 1, 8 through 9. It says, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But what about the sins that I keep on doing? What about the sins that I'm afraid that if anybody else knew about, they would reject me? They would want nothing to do with me. What about the stuff that I'm just embarrassed to admit to myself and certainly to other people? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins, he, not you, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's 1 John 1 and 9, and that's a a scripture that I would strongly encourage for us to memorize and to recite uh, over our lives. And the last piece is worship. 
what do I mean by worship? Worship does not mean after this sermon, we'll, send, we'll stand for like five minutes and sing a song. And when the worship team hits the right note, you feel warm and tingly on the inside. That's not worship. Worship is orienting your entire life around something. The person who forsakes their family to make as much money as possible is worshiping money. They have oriented their entire life around getting that paper. Now, I'm not a, a saying don't get the bag when you can get it, but what I am saying is this. Look at in your life, what are you orienting your entire life around? That is what you are worshiping. Whose opinion of you matters the most? That is who you worship. That is who you have as the thing that you need above all things. And so the biggest impediment to us living as forgiven people is that you and I are idolatrous people who worship our opinion over the opinion of the Father. So you can read a scripture that says you're forgiven. And you're like, well, I don't feel it. So since I don't feel it, it's my opinion and God's opinion on the same level. But you don't have to feel forgiven to be forgiven. The point of the scripture is that eventually your feelings will catch up to the truth of the reality, but you don't have to feel forgiven to be forgiven. And worship is resetting your perspective and resetting whose opinion matters the most. And if God's opinion is the one, God is the righteous judge. God is the one in charge of all things. God is the one who speaks something out of nothing. And whatever he says, it is what it is. If you read the earliest pages of scripture in Genesis, one of the things I love the most about the description of the power of God is that God speaks things and they appear. God doesn't work hard for things to appear. God doesn't put things on layaway to happen. God speaks it and it happens. God said, let there be light, light. When God says you're forgiven, you're forgiven. And the biggest challenge is you and I hold our opinion of ourselves in equal esteem or sometimes higher esteem than, than God's. I, I told the story before, but um, uh, when a couple of years ago, my uh, uh, father-in-law had a pretty bad uh, speeding ticket in Maryland. And uh, we went to court, and I'm an attorney in New York State, but I don't have permission to practice in other states. So I sent a letter to the court and to the judge to get permission to try this case. And I was pretty nervous because when we got in, the DA announced that, hey, everybody in uh, this courtroom could go to jail for your traffic offense. I went to the DA, I said, listen, it's going to be a lonely ride home if I get my father-in-law thrown in jail. Please help me out. The DA was kind of arrogant. He was like, we're going to hold your father-in-law as charged, which basically means we're not cutting him a deal. We're not offering any reduction. His only hope is to just plead guilty and then to fall at the mercy of the judge to hopefully not get a harsh penalty. I went back to the bench feeling a little deflated, and then the judge called me up and said, Mr. Rice, I read your letter. And I said, yes, ma'am. Um, your Honor, I'm here representing my father-in-law. Um, I'm uh, uh, credentialed in New York, but I got permission to uh, appear before Your Honor this, for this one case. She said, step back. And I was like, okay, we're 0 for 2 right now. <laughs> So she calls the case, and everybody stands up, and she says, the people versus James Moreland, case dismissed. Right. <laughs> the bailiff was confused. The DA was confused. We were confused. I was like, hey, hey, up, 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 up. <laughs> everybody get up. We're leaving. We're leaving. We are leaving. We ran out of that courtroom as fast as we could before the judge <laughs> changed her mind. Now, here's the truth of the matter. To this day, I have no idea what happened. It wasn't because of a great argument. I presented no argument. They had us dead to rights. They had all the facts on their side. For whatever reason, the judge, in her decision-making authority, decided to dismiss the case, and it was it. It was over. When the one with authority speaks, it's over. First Corinthians 4 and 3, uh, it says these words. Now write this down. I didn't include this in the slides. 1 Corinthians 4, 3 through 4. The Apostle Paul is talking. He says this. It is of little importance to me that I should be judged by you or by any human court. He says these words. In fact, I don't even judge myself, for I am not conscious 
of anything against myself, but I am not justified by this. It is the Lord who judges me. What worship does is it takes our eyes and our focus off of ourselves as the judge, and it rightly gives God the authority to speak over our lives. And so many of us need a brand new model at how we do something called repentance. Repentance is the method by which you go to God to apologize and to ask God for forgiveness. And most of us have a very me-centered version of repentance. The me-centered version of repentance starts with you, and it keeps you at the center of everything, and then you will always struggle to feel forgiven if you take this approach. So it starts off with by questioning, what did I do? So what did I do? I, I sinned in some word, some fashion. I lied, I cheated on my taxes, I was lazy, I did this, this, or whatever. You can fill in the blank with different things. Now, immediately from that, we build a theology of ourselves. Well, if I did this, then who am I? I'm a liar, I'm a people pleaser, I'm a loser, I, I can't believe I did this. Again, I'm inconsistent. I, again, fill in the blanks with the ways we accuse ourselves or allow the accuser to fill in the blanks of who we are. What has God done? I don't know, it kind of feels like he's ignored us or he's just waiting for us to get it right before he accepts us. Then who is God? I don't know, I mean, he's distant. He's waiting for me to figure it out and then maybe God will be cool once I like do a really fantastic job to like work my way back. Now, this is a me-centered version that will always lead you to shame and just overwhelming amounts of guilt because it's all about you and it does not bring into account the judge, the righteous one who actually has the power and the ability to speak forgiveness over your life. The biblical model of repentance starts with God. Who is God? That is the most important question you will ever answer. Who is God? God is, as we've learned in this prayer, he is a good father. He's holy. He is one who forgives. He's a redeemer. What has God done? God sent his son Jesus as our atoning sacrifice for our sins. He nailed all of my sins completely to the cross. God made him who had no sin to be sin so that I might become the righteousness of God. That's what God has done. While I was still a sinner, God died, Jesus died for the ungodly. What has God done? That he sent his only son into the world that whoever will believe will not perish but have everlasting life. We can go on and on and on and on what God has done. Who am I? I am redeemed. I am loved. I'm cared for. I'm corrected. I'm a beloved child who is secure in the hands of a, of a good savior. Sometimes I'm a wayward sheep, but I'm a wayward sheep under the control and the vision and the guidance of a good shepherd. What should I do? I should grow. I should make some very difficult decisions to confess my sins. I should surround my, myself with people who will hold me accountable. I should come boldly before the throne of grace and find it in my time of need. But I, more importantly, most importantly, I should run into the arms of a gracious savior, asking him to forgive me and to cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Now, if you take a God-centered approach towards repentance and forgiveness, it will change everything about the way you pray. When Jesus tell, tells us to ask God to forgive us of our sins, notice where this is in the prayer. This is after he has first established himself as a good father who wants to take care of us, who does take care of us. And so as we are thinking about this in our own lives, I want to close us with the Lord's Prayer today. And as we say the line, uh, forgive us of our debts, uh, I don't want that line to ring louder than our Father in heaven or any of the other lines in the scripture. So therefore, you should pray like this, our Father in heaven, the one who cares for us, the one who provides for us, the one who watches over us, the one who sacrifices for us, the one who sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins, our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Lord, may your name be honored as holy, not just in the streets, but in my heart. Your kingdom come, Lord. Your will be done in my life. Lord, not my will for my life, but your will be done for my life on earth as it is in heaven. And Lord, give us today our daily bread. Give me the things that I need today to be strong, strong enough to walk and follow you and forgive us of our debts. 
as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Amen.